And that's when I said, that's not a pineapple. That's my wife. Anyway, you know, back back on topic. Welcome to the Team GPT podcast. Um, I haven't said that in a while. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an old trend. It's an old, an old trend. Speaking of trends, right? So um, an interesting uh, question was posed by one of our members, Kim. Shout out to Kim. We'll put her Instagram in the link below. Um, she was she was wondering. So earlier on, we talked about a certain trend, which was uh, the use of RPE in training, and that got us thinking. For the question I'm posing today is, what are some trends that you guys remember or that you're seeing that um, are sort of underrated or should be more prevalent, or what trends that came and passed that should have been st- that should have stuck around longer? Yes, I got the question out. It's there. You nailed it. Nailed it. Um, I'm not sure that question was very well worded at all. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? I said but, it. Um, all right. I'll, my big one, I think, is just, we talked, like you said, we talked about RP in the past. Um, I don't mind someone using RPE to tell me what they think a set felt like. Um, so for those that don't know RPE, 10 being an absolute max, 9 being 1 in the tank, 8 being 2 in the tank, 7, 3, etc. Um, you know, so if someone says, oh, that felt like a 9, that, that means they could have done one more rep, um, or maybe they could have added some weight. I think that's fine to use that as a uh, qualifier, uh, just to let us know what's going on, to give us some more data. Uh, but I don't like it for choosing your weights. Um, I think more often than not, the way you feel set you up for failure more than a good day. Um, one of our other members, I want, I talk about this a lot with, um, you know, you have a bad day at work, you don't eat enough, you're tired, whatever, 8 million reasons. And, you know, your eight RPE for the day ends up being something that normally would be like a six. Um, and if you were just training with percentages, which is the way that I generally like to go with, you probably could have hit the numbers anyway. Um, and you would have been fine. You might, you know, you maybe have to adjust a little bit, but probably not as much as you think once you warm up and get going. Um, so I think, you know, I, I mean, Mike Deshier coming up with RP stuff, like I think it's actually a really good idea. And like his original book, like for, I thought it was a great book. And I think a lot of people forgot about reading it and they started to apply the situation because like he says in there, anything below a seven is a waste of time. And you see tons of people posting RP sixes and like, in his book, that's a warm up. Um, you know, seven is like speed work. Eight is two in the tank. Nine is one in the tank. Uh, ten is hard. And you know, people are trying to think sub maximal, and they're using six as a sub max. Well, technically, so is a seven and eight and a nine. Uh, ten is max effort. Nine, you know, so even a nine is sub max. Uh, but if there's a point where, if you're training that sub maximally and you're leaving that much in the tank, what are you getting out of it? Um, you know, are you getting the same benefits as pushing harder? And I'm not saying that you have to go max. Like, again, most of my training is uh, submaximal, um, but our sport is a maximal sport. Um, so at some point, you have to train it to get better at it. If you just do RP six sevens and maybe singles at eight to base off to base your numbers for the day, then when the weight gets heavy, it's going to feel real heavy. Um, so that's one that I guess like is not, not something I would want. You know, it's, it's I, I mean, trendy, I guess is the right word because it's, it's used a lot. Um, to spin and it that, like, or that people are just using it as on a scale of one to 10, it felt like a nine, whatever. Just, you know, like, I just, it's, it's, my like, camera like, just puked. Um, well, I just, I think like, I like percentages. I think that's, I'll use that when I like, I mean, percentages have been around forever for a reason. Um, they work. Um, and I know that the argument being that, you know, let's say you get stronger over a block. So 90% now is not 90% 12 weeks from now, which is the hope. Hopefully you've gotten stronger. So 90% at week one is now 86, 87% on week 12. Um, but you should also be able to tell that by, let's say on week one, you hit 90% and it was tough. But by week 12, it's a lot faster, a lot easier. Um, 
the techniques better, then you know that you've gotten stronger. Um, and by doing the same weights, where like I said with RP, it's more of a feel thing. Um, I, I say this a lot, like I don't care how you feel. Um, the problem with like how you feel is on meet day, it doesn't matter how you feel. If you don't feel good and you're sick or you're tired, or you didn't sleep well because you know you were worried about the meet or you had to travel, it doesn't matter. You still have to go out and lift. So if you're like, oh, well, everything feels heavy today, so I guess I'm going to do, you know, RP eight and take that as my third. No, like you have to go heavy sometimes. So I wish percentages were around a lot more. Still, I think a lot of people don't use it as much. Um, my main work, um, so like when I'm programming. Um, the, we have three different kinds of main work. We do some maximal uh, volume work and heavy work. The submax is based off percentages. The volume work is based off percentages. Um, the heavy work recently I've switched up a little bit, giving the people a little bit more leeway um, where it used to be percentages, but now I'm giving a little more leeway, but I'm looking to push on those days. I'm not looking for an eight RPM. Like I'll write in there, like I want you to hit a really hard set of five and then go heavier instead of like doing a single at eight and then doing your back offsets. Um, I'm basically doing like the other way around, like a five at nine, nine and a half, and then singles working up to probably a max of the day. Um, the five tire jump, but you're still working up to a max. So again, like most of my work is percentage based. Um, even the supplemental stuff, I'm starting to throw in some more percentage based. So I wish that was around more. I like that a lot. There's less, there's less feeling. It's more, I like the, I like the data, the science, the hard numbers behind it. Like if I, I, like, I can tell people like, you should be able to do this. And you're like, Oh, you know, my girlfriend broke up with me and like you end up doing 40 pounds less. That's like, okay. That happens sometimes. But I think some people use it as an excuse to go light all the time. Um, you see that a lot in the gym, a lot of people like the, you know, the submax crew. Um, but on the other end, you've also got that, the, the people that use it so they can just be like, oh, that was an eight. And it was, a, it was a 10. Like it was a grindy. It was like, looked like death. It was a full max effort lift and they made it an eight. Um, I think both of those are allowing your feelings to get in the way of good training. Um, I, like I said, I don't care about the feelings. I want to, I want to see the numbers. I want to see the data that drives the training. It's, I, I think I agree with that. It's a kind of interesting, not that like, RPA has become or has been trendy or like RIR has been trendy. I feel like almost just because of like the numbers themselves and how people react to them, like it became kind of like, ah, oh, that was a nine or like that was a seven, like just the numbers itself and how people, different people react to how they rate it. I guess it's, it's that almost became trendy in itself. Um, I don't think like the system, like I don't think to share system became, was like meant to be like, Oh, this is the trendy thing. Now it's just, the system is, and just auto-regulating is, puts it in people's hands. So therefore people made it their own thing and it became trendy. So yeah, it's interesting it's to see how people it. react to it. I think, I think what, what, at least what I'm trying to, what I'm understanding what you're saying is that people took a very objective scientific method of RPE and made it subjective in the sense that it feels like a certain number. So that's the number it is instead yeah. of based upon the numbers I can actually do right? This is what it should be in terms of RPE. Right. Yeah. And, and again, like, you know, there are fluctuations in strength up and down. So some days the percentages won't work, but if you don't overshoot the percentages to begin with, you should be pretty close. Um, since Kim asked this question, I'll use her as an example. I wrote in a uh, conventional deadlift for her the other day. Um, I gave her three sets of five. I gave her a weight and she said it was really hard, but she was able to do it where like if, if I didn't give her that number, she might not have done that much because she wouldn't have had the confidence to do it. Um, where, because I said, here's the number, do it. She did it. Um, I think that matters a lot. Like it, and that's one of those mental things that's going to help you on meet day. So when you have that third attempt that, you know, hopefully you haven't ever tried it before, you know, it's a new PR, you're going for something new. You understand the feeling that it's going it, to, it's, it's going to feel heavy. It's not going to feel nice and breezy and your technique's not going to be dead on. Uh, you're going to see some breakdown and that's okay because you're prepared for it. Um, 
I think that's a big one. So yeah, I mean, like, you know, the, the program itself, like using RP, like, if you, like I said, if you read his book, I love the book. I stole a shit ton from that book and I use it all the time. I tell me read it all the time. But the funny thing is like everyone that programs by RPE has never read the book by the guy who literally wrote the book on RPE. Um, and that's weird to me. Like, I feel like if I'm going to tell people to do something, I should have a good understanding of it. I'm not sure everyone does. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think even the idea of auto regulation is trendy in itself. It's just this system has caught on so much, whether it's, and like when, F, I don't know what year did the book come out? It was, I don't know what year. for a while. But, but like a it took time. a little while for a lot of like research to come out after, like a lot more research has come out after it. And it took a long time. It's probably still in development where people are still learning more about it. But it's interesting that like it, it kind of took off like wildfire and that was like almost like the lingo was trendy, but it's not like auto regulation isn't trendy and training, just help people apply it and talk about it. It is kind of what became trendy and weird. Right. And that's, that's, it's interesting. I think of like West side, like, I'm, and we talked about before we started recording West side, because that's a, a program style that I like a lot. Um, you know, on their max effort days, they're looking to work up to, you know, a new PR and whatever movement they're doing. But Louis say all the time, like if, if it's not there that day, then maybe they hit, they try to go for a heavy triple instead of a heavy single if they're working up and it's just not there. Cause there's times it's just not going to be there. There's times you come in the gym and for whatever reason, you know, it just isn't there. Like I have this little like athlete readiness scale that I haven't showed either of you guys or anyone yet, but like I have it trying to figure out how to actually use it. But it's like, you know, great on a scale of one to five, like, you know, how did you eat today? How did you drink uh, today? How did you sleep last night? Uh, how sore are you? How ready are you for this workout? And what's your stress level like? And basically, the higher the number, the more likely you are to have a good workout. The lower the number, the more likely you are to have a bad workout. Now, it, it, it might not work, but like, you know, if you score like a, I think the lowest you can score on it is a six. If you get a six, like I would tell you to adjust your workout because it's probably a bad day. That means you didn't eat well, you didn't sleep well you're sore as hell. You don't even want to be at the gym. Like you're not gonna have a good day. So adjust, um, auto regulate, you know, maybe you do a little bit less or like in West side, go grab the sled and do some sled work, do something different and come back to live to fight another day. If you push it, you're probably gonna get hurt. But if you score like a 28, I think is the highest, like that means you like slept nine hours, you ate perfectly. Like you're, you know, you're completely hydrated. You just took a crap load of pre-workout, you know, you're not sore, your stress level is nothing, like you're just ready to kill it. Like, okay, maybe we ought to, ought to regulate up in those, those days where maybe you can push a little bit more. Um, I think, you, you know, you need to have some. Um, I mean, Dave Ricks talked about like in his program, like he follows, a, I think, a fairly linear program. And there was, he, this was like a couple years ago, he said like late in the program, he was supposed to hit like a heavy double. And as he was working up, he's like, nope. And he took that double for a single and called it for the day because it just, a double wasn't there. And I'm pretty sure that was the year he squatted the record, like the, the open world record yeah. at like 58 or 59 years old. Um, so like it, yeah. You, I like, so I like percentages because I like having that number in front of me and in front of the lifter, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not written in stone. You know, if I say to you to do 90% for a triple, which is really hard uh and you're, and the double is just like, holy shit, I'm going to die. Don't do the triple. Um, on the other hand, I like, I probably screwed up Marie's day with that, but Marie had a workout once where she was supposed to hit like a heavy triple on bench and then work up singles or heavy double, I think. And the double was like so easy, which was so unexpected that I was like, do another rep. So she hit it for a triple and I was like, do another rep. And she hit it for a uh, four and I was like I almost yelled to hit an do another one for a set of five and I was like oh her singles are fucked um, and it did like her singles were not as good but like it was like her best previous double that she hit for four like that was like we went I mean that's way off program but like it was working so that's okay and like you just said like it's just auto regulation it's just just using how you feel but like have a have a plan have a plan. Like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go into the day think like not thinking about what it's going to, what I'm going to lift until I start to feel it. You know, like, I don't want to feel that like, I, I don't know. I mean, 
It's kind of like the difference. Everything between feels like, heavy. Nothing feels nothing. I don't know anyone that like squats four hundred and five pounds. Is like man, that was air. <laughs> Everyone's like, nope, that was weight on my back. Like, well, it's kind of like, like it's between like walk. like lifting and training. I mean, like you can say like for, like when I remember when I used to lift when I the, just started going to the gym, it was like fuck, it, I'm gonna do this for today. I'm gonna fuck them this today. Whatever. It was fun, but like if you're training for a me or if you're in a serious training cycle, like it's kind of hard to like have consistent progress for most people. If you don't have like a set plan where they're like, I feel like, okay, then I'm going to do this, which is fine, but it just might hinder the progress you're, you're, you're planning for. Just have a plan in motion. That's why it's not like, like RP has a scale where it matches the percentages, but it's not like, it's just a matter of like objectivity where you want to, I think it's easier to have like even a ballpark number. Like you've given us numbers where like hit something from like, 405 to 425 like a ballpark but just so it's like the numbers out of your hands to a point where you can adjust it but like it's not like a single digit number where you're like ah oh, fuck it this is how i feel yeah so even like like on our, the sub max days that i write are generally i i usually will get it's one or two options depending on where we are it's like okay we're gonna do this amount of sets and reps at this weight no question crush the reps they're sub maximal they should be fairly easy move on to the next thing the other way I'll do it is I'll say, okay, let's say the first three sets of the six that you're doing were just really easy. I'll say, okay, you can add this much weight to the bar. Uh, usually that much weight is about two and a half to 3%. So depending on the person, it might, it's going to be somewhere in the range of five to 20 pounds. Um, and there'll be days where people be like, oh yeah, I, def I went up 10, like crushed it. It was fine. And other days they're just like, nope, stayed there. And there's days where like that higher number that I give the option to every single person I give that to is capable of hitting that number no problem for the sets and reps because it is it is a submaximal lift but maybe they just don't feel great that day so they stay at the slightly lighter weight and just get good work in but i said if they feel good cool go up that's fine um but i'm still keeping them in that like that three percent window so it's like you know maybe we're doing 70 percent for threes and then i'll be like okay you can go to 73 percent like it's a small jump but you know some days it's there some days it's not and that's fine um, but to work up and be like, ah, this feels heavy. I'm going to, this is going to be my working weight for the day. And what if it was 20 pounds less than what you were supposed to do really? Um, you know, what it is like, it, like my said is if you put 20 pounds on, could you still do it and just like, and it's fine. Or is that 20 pounds going to kill you? That's the problem. You kind of have to make that decision on the fly, but I think most people can put it on and I think they're going to be fine. Yeah. So how does one, because we're lucky enough to have you programming for us and you have a very good understanding of this like percentile, but say if in individuals were either programming for themselves or just working out, how do you know that like we are uh, exerting enough uh, effort into making sure that we're progressing? That makes sense. Because like well, you kind of, you have to auto-regulate yourself, but it's, it's kind of hard to if you have like these subjective sort of influences on how you feel that day, it might be hard to make those judgment calls. Right. Well, I think some of it's tough because like, I mean, Mike does talk about, you have to make your own percentage chart based off your RPE because, you know, if I said to you, said, I want you to hit a triple at, at a nine RPE. All right. So effectively it would be a four rep max. Um, you know, the old school max calculators would tell you 88, percent ish um what i find for most people is 88 percent before would probably bury you um that's a lot um so then you got to figure out you know how's the person so uh one thing i've been starting to play around a little bit more is giving people like volume tests so basically what i'll do is we'll give 80 percent of their current max um and a, and a max that they've done recently um it you know i don't want it to be Oh, I squatted 500 six months ago, but now my best is like 450 because I haven't been in the gym and then do an 80% off of 500. Um, so we'll do it off a of current um, recent max. Um, and I'm looking to see how many reps they get. Um, if you get two or three, then either we're really bad at volume or maybe the max is different than what it is, or maybe it's, you know, just a tough day. But if you get like 10, um, either your max is a lot higher than we thought it was or you know, maybe you can work with percentages a little bit better too. Um, so I think it's good to know for that. 
Um, you know, like I said, if I give you 80% and you can hit for 10, like that's, you're, you're very good at reps and you probably need to do more heavy work where if I give you 80% and you hit it for three, you probably need to do more reps. Um, so you kind of need to test yourself. You can't just say, okay, 90% is a triple because I find that most people, when you give them 90%, they're good for one or maybe two. Um, if they hit it for a third, it's either they're really good at reps or maybe it's not 90% anymore. Maybe they're stronger and now it's actually like 86%. Um, which obviously you won't know until you test, but that's where like the one rep max calculators come into. Um, those can give you a general good idea. I, I use those a lot with different exercises and say, okay, based off this, this is where you should be. Um, to use one in particular, like I did this with Jen recently, Jen wanted to bench 200 and like she had two or three different exercises that her sets, reps and weights were, were showing that she had the strength to bench 200 she basically just had to do it. Um, and then the day that I, like, I told her, I was like, send it. And she had 205. Um, so the strength was there. She just had to have the, the chance to do it. But if, like, all of her rep calculators and, like, percentage of work was showing that she was good for, like, 192, then it's unlikely that she would have suddenly hit 200 or 205. So I know that's not a super great answer to your question because there's a, there's a lot – it's a lot more in-depth than that. Um, if we're going to generalize it, which I – generally don't like to do but women are generally better at volume than men are beginners are always better at volume than uh, more advanced lifters are um lighter lifters are generally better at volume um but then the fun thing there is if you're how just how shape how, how much in shape are you um a lot of power lifters are not in shape um if you're in terrible shape like a set of six might be the end of the world where like it probably shouldn't be, um, you know. Leah's been doing a lot of cardio lately, and she and I say a lot. It's really not a lot. And she asked me, she's like, "Is this going to ruin anything?" I'm like, "No. Like you have to do an intense amount of cardio to really ruin your strength." Um, but I told her, I said, "It'll probably help her rep sets. It'll probably help her recover in between." So I'm like, "That's another one that might skew the numbers." You know, maybe a set of five. You're like, "Wow, that felt terrible because you're out of breath and you're winded." But really, like strength wise, it was fine. Um, so yeah, that's not a super great answer. Um, I think using RP in that example, um, you know, if you think there's only one left in the tank, then that's probably a good thing. I usually, I'm looking for most things to be an eight or nine. Um, seven should be like speed work or a warm up. 10 means you're probably overshot, you know? Um, so if you're living between eight and nine, it's still sub maximal, but it's heavy enough to matter. Um, so, you know, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to at least take every set and add an RPE to it. So you can start to learn yourself better and get the feel for it. And then once you know what it feels like, then you've got a better idea instead of just saying, Ooh, I don't know that that felt bad. Um, you know, push it and say, yeah, it's almost kind of like a, your, like your training maturity or like your training age plays a big role in it. And I think you you can apply some of this stuff differently with different athletes. I think that's where like the aspect of coaching where we see all this like general, like uh, program based up RP like templates, which are great because it gives you like a start, but it, I think it really kind of depends on the person and like a coach knowing their athlete or like you knowing yourself. So it's kind of like a tool that can fluctuate. That, I think that's actually like a good point. Like you think about like, not as much now. I don't, and I also don't look at as many programs now, but like several years ago, like AMRAPs were like the thing. Yeah. Like, you know, you'd, you'd always, your last set would be an AMRAP. And what you end up getting is you get those people that will like, will die with the bar on their back. You know, they'll, they'll take 80% and they'll, they'll hold it for 15 seconds on their back until they can do another rep. And then they'll end up hitting a set of 17, um, which if you take enough rest in between reps, is possible, but like you're, you're fucked for like a week, you're done. Um, and then you've got the people that are like, Oh, I'm done. And they hit it for two. And you're like, what do you, what do you like? You know, full well, they could have done it for six or seven, but they just kind of called it. Um, so again, like what Brian said, like knowing your athlete, like I know who I can give AMRAPs to and expect a good result. And I know who I can expect a bad result. Um, Bucks last week had a volume test on deadlifts. So we basically had to like, he wasn't resetting, but it wasn't a touch and go rep. 
And I think I told him um, if he got to six, stop. No matter what, stop. Um, the goal was it was, it was going to be um, a little bit left in the tank. And he pulled the six. And it was hard. He probably had another one left, which would have been fine. That's what I was kind of looking for. I, I figured based on the math that anything over six, I've been really happy with. And him and I laughed about it later because he said to me, he goes, if you told me to do 10, I would have fucking done 10. And it would have crushed him. But he would have done 10. He would have figured it out. But he would have been, like, probably jacked up for a week. Um, where other people, and I won't use names on this one because it's not as nice, so it'll be like, okay, I want you to get 10. And they're like, oh, I got seven. It was really hard. And I'm like, no, like, like, I, like I've seen it enough where, like, and, again, like, knowing your athlete or – Again, like RP, maybe is not the best. Like we've got lifters that'll be like that. We'll say that was an eight, an eight RP. I'm like that was a twelve. Like you died. Um, or I'll make fun of Bobby in this one. Bobby's the one that'll be like, okay, hit an eight, and he'll he'll show me, and I'm like, dude, that was a five. Um, <laughs> now one argument with that too is like RP is your relative perceived exertion. Your coach cannot make the call until they know you so well that they can tell like what it looked like and the speed and all that of what they can actually say what it was. It is what you feel like. So when some, like for me, like I'm a very fast lifter. Actually, all of us are, are speed lifters. Like there's not a whole lot of grind. Um, so most of the, most of your, for both of you and for me, like top level lifts still move fairly quickly. Um, you, it's not someone like Bucks who will grind out a squat for 12 seconds. Um, so the problem is with people like us, like when someone watching it, we'll see 90% and they'll be like, Oh man, that was an RP six. And we're like, no, that sucked. Yeah. But we move it quickly where someone like, uh, like bucks. Um, if you don't know him, you'll look at it and be like, that was a nine and a half. You're pretty much done. And then he'll do three more sets, increasing the weight every time. Yeah. He's insane. <laughs> and like you're like, and you're like, what the hell happened? Um, you know, and some people can do that, but now by the outside view, RPE at that point is meaningless. So when a coach is calling RPE, you, uh, first off, I, I don't like that. I don't like, because like, it's not your perceived exertion. Um, and the other argument too is like, I, you know, you can look at a lift and based on what it looks like. Like, I know you guys well enough that I could say go up this much weight, but I don't know what it felt like. You know, maybe, maybe you did something and, it still looked good. And I use my buddy Carl's as for an example, back in the garage when we were lifting years ago, he smoked like a 565 squat, absolutely smoked it, racked the bar, collapsed to the floor. And we're like, everyone in the room was like, what happened? And he's like, I don't know, something in my back popped. If, if he didn't do that, I would have been like, go 600, let's go. And he would have hit 600 at that time. Instead, he had to take a few weeks off and build back up because he got hurt. But I said, from just that quick look, you're like, oh, that was an easy lift. No, it was. And, and Carl could grind reps, but like that was just not that day. So I'm really getting on like a shit list on RPE, but I don't mean to. Like, <laughs> what? We, don't, we don't mean to make RPE sound bad. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing tool when used properly. Yeah, it's just right now, I don't know if uh, people understand it enough to use it properly. Yeah. Like, I, the latest thing at meets in it, like, I know it's like, there's all good intentions for it, but like, I don't know, it's been like the last couple of years more so where like, people have been telling each other like, more so like, that was easy, you need to go up or something like that, trying to convince people to like, add weight, but that's really nice, you're being nice, but like, you have no idea who that person is, like, doing it to strangers, like, Add like a hundred pounds. I'm like, dude, two pounds might crush this person. You don't know it. So it's like, it's, it's powerlifting is a super simple sport and being in the sport, you might be like, oh, I got to look really easy. But like, it's also a lot of intricacies. And then that's when like having a coach or like a, like a training partner or like someone that can handle you that like knows it, like comes in handy because I've seen so much where someone's like, that was really easy. I'm like, they might die if you keep saying that. It, and it's like, it, it's, it's become more. So I, I see, I hear it more often, but like, there's a lot of intricacies that go into it and kind of you should know your lifter and know yourself. Do you think there's a huge, not a huge, but there's like a, an ego sort of push for certain individuals who are all like, Oh, if someone tells me I need to go up. I can go up. Like, 
Um, I think it depends on, like, on the, I, I mean, first, lifting is an egotistical thing to kind of begin with, right? Yes. Like, you do it to get stronger and to, and to, and to look, be look better and feel better. Like, it's, you know, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> like, but I mean, like, I mean, there's some lifters that if I tell them to go up, like, I've been coaching them long enough that then they then have that confidence because I have the confidence. Um, where sometimes, like, and there's other lifters that I'm like, e like, you know, they, they have more confidence in their next lift than I do based on what it looks like, but they know better than I do. At the end of the day, like, I'm the coach, but it, it, it's you. It's like, you know, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to keep using Bucks, I guess, as an example today. But the last meet he did, um, his second squat was not good. Like, it just it didn't look good, and I was like, okay. And I, he's like, no, I'm fine. I got it. And I was like, all right. And I put in a, the, the number that he wanted, which I think was like five kilos higher than what I was thinking based on the second attempt. And the third attempt was significantly better than the second attempt, and he had more in him. And I was like, shit. But, like, he knew where, like I said, if I made the call based on what it looked like to me, he would have actually squatted five kilos less. But he was like, no, I got it. Let's go. And it was fine. Um, so that is important. Um, you need to have that coach and lifter talk. Um, I think there's a little bit too much trend, I guess we'll use that of like, like the, the coach having the whole say, like, no, this is what you're going to do. Like, no, it's, you're not lifting the weight. I'm not lifting the weight for you. So like, I'm going to tell you what I think you're capable of in that moment. But if you're like, hell no, then we're going to adjust. Um, on the opposite end, like maybe I have to, I need to talk you into it, but if you're not there and if it's not ready for you, like, I can't do that. There's a lot of coaches. I think they're just like, no, this is the plan. We're sticking to it. Um, and the, and the trend that I, the one that I don't, I'm using trend, I don't need to hear, um, is like having the third attempt planned and then seeing the second attempt be good. And then they're like, let's send it. They go even heavier and they miss. Like I plan for the best possible outcome and work backwards. I don't plan for like a good outcome and then be like, wow, that looked better. Let's go, let's send it. Because now you're making this big jump that like, you know, maybe you jump five kilos from the first to second. And now you're like, wow, second looked great. Let's jump 10 kilos. And now it feels like death. I'd rather jump 10 and then be like, okay, we, we have another seven and a half and so, or, you know, or adjust down and maybe we have five. Um, so I don't like that trend either of like sending it. Um, I know I'll use it once in a while for people because like they get it. Um, when I was coaching the sub junior junior worlds, I, the joke became that I said, send it a hundred times because like we had so many lifters that like they had already won, like they won gold medal on their second deadlift attempt that like, screw it, go for the world record. At one point, I said, like, we were, we were in second place, and, like, we couldn't – like, we had a pull. It would have been, like, a 27-and-a-half kilo PR for the kid to, like, to come in first. And it would have been, like, a 32-and-a-half kilo, two, 32 and a half kilo jump from a second to his third. And I told Zach to do it because, fuck it, why not? Like, we have second locked up. Let's, like, let's go for it. Let the kid get a shot at a huge PR and the win. I mean, it was a stupid call. We didn't do it. Like, but – there's a, there's a time and a place, but I think it's become like trendy and they do it all the time. So I don't like that. Yeah. I see that too. Not How long have we been talking for ever? Uh, yeah, we've, we've around like 30 minutes. Um, I, I mean, like, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that gets that's old that just gets repackaged and it becomes trendy. Um, I don't know. Like I, I'd rather look at, see what someone's been doing for a long time. That's working for a long time. than what's been looking, looking like working for the short term. Um, I'm uh, like, this, this just sounds like I'm shitting on everything, but like DUP, um, DUP has been shown in the studies to work really well. I know a lot of people to do it. Um, but no one's done it for that long because no one, it hasn't been around long enough. Um, you know, is it going to work for 10 years straight? Um, do you need to do it in 12 week blocks and take it off? I don't know. Um, I use it the last three to six weeks into a meet. We use it a lot because it's let you get a lot of technique practice, a lot of work with the, with the main lifts. Um, 
but to do it year round, I hate it. Um, I, but that's super trendy right now because like, you know, the idea is that you're powerlifting, so you should power lift all the time. Um, my argument is that you should be strong at everything. And if we find a weak link at something, it will show up eventually. Um, so I don't like doing the main lifts over and over. Um, that's the trendy part. Um, we'll, we'll f I'm somewhere in between like West side and DUP. Um, I, we still squat bench deadlift every week, obviously, but like we do supplementals that are different all the time. Um, you know, we'll do safety squat bar and giant cam bar and box squats and high bar and front squats where a lot of people will be like, why you don't do that in competition? Um, we also don't do tempo in competition. So why are you doing that? Like you also don't do doubles in competition or sevens. So if that's the argument that we should only do singles forever and ever and ever, um, I think you should be good at everything. So like if your high bar is significantly weaker than your low bar, why fix it, get better at it. And that's, that's a big thing. Um, so doing the lifts over and over, I think, you know, that's a trendy one that I'm really not a fan of. Um, we were talking about before we started the combinating resistance, which goes back to West side, but I feel like if we keep talking about that right now, it's going to turn into a really long podcast. So maybe Syed, this is when you could be like, come see us next time for a combinating resistance. Come see us next time for a combinating resistance.